Hello, it's Keith here, and this is the final of the Grime 6502 series. Now, I haven't done any extra programming since the seventh episode, but what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss the entire source code. We're going to go through line by line of the main module and also the simple tile function that make up the majority of this game. So, if you want to look at the code yourself, this should give you an introduction to how the code works so you'll understand what you're seeing. So, let's make a start and have a look at the actual source code. So here's the grime6502.asm file, which is the main bulk of the code. So you can see at the start, we've got some definitions for each system, and they're basically the same with just a few tweaks. So the first one is game RAM, which is the memory location within the system memory, which is the writable memory for the data which the game uses. The game uses various variables, including two entire backups of the tile map. And of course, some of the systems are using ROM, which is read-only memory. So we need a position on each system, which is not going to interfere with the game code and which is random access memory. So in the case of the links, it's a day triple zero. Next, we've got a command called BMP normal. You'll see in other cases, this is BMP BBC or BMP tile. Now, this is defining what kind of screen system it uses and system tile uses this to know how to draw to the screen. You'll also see there's a tile width because some of the systems are different bits per pixel. So some are a single byte width and some are four byte width and there's some that are two byte width. So this is defining how simple tile will draw to the screen. The screen width also varies. The maximum is 32 tiles wide, but some of the systems have smaller widths because they have more limited screens. Then there's a palette definition here for how many colors the system uses. A 16 color system, of course, has 16. And there's also some that only have four and also some that have only two. Small screen is a special function. It doesn't actually change the size of the screen. It's actually relating to the randomness of some of the events because they need to occur more often on a small screen or how fast the game runs because the game tends to run too fast on small screens. Default control mode, this relates to two button mode. Some of the systems have two fire buttons like the Lynx, whereas some of them do not like the Atari 5200. And so default control mode switches between the default mode which the game is played with. Short tile is a special function exclusive to the links. The links can actually use 8 pixel by 6 pixel tiles rather than the typical 8 by 8 tiles. It's only the links that has this function. Screen height is relating to screen width. It's again the size of the visible tile map. And you can see these are roughly mimicked across all of the systems. Half width font is a special one for some of the machines which can have a 2 bit or 4 bit per pixel mode. And the in 4 bit per pixel mode, we can halve the width of the font, which makes it blurred, but makes it that we can have more text on the screen, which is preferable. So that's just an extra function for those systems there. And you can see if we've not set anything else, we're defaulting to the normal screen size, 32 tiles by 24 tiles, which is the maximum the game engine can support. You can see here the definitions for the game's code logic. There's the tile map, which is the visible tile map, and a backup tile map, which is the last viewed tile map. This allows the system to detect what changes need to be drawn to the screen, and also allows the logic code of the grime growing to actually work out what was previously shown on the screen. Key, key scanner key presses isn't actually used by Grime 6502. It, it's legacy from Grime Z80 because Grime 6502 reads directly the joysticks, whereas Grime Z80 could use keyboards as well. I'll be honest, my um, keyboard reading code for the 6502 systems isn't, isn't ready yet, so we can only read joysticks in this game. Now we've got player position, X and Y, random seed, which is our random number generation, fast growth, which is where the player isn't playing enough, so we're accelerating the growth of the grime to give them more of a challenge, player direction, that's the direction the player is facing, bullet X and Y, the position of the bullet, because there's only ever one bullet on the screen, nothing shot, that's how long since the player last shot anything, that's what decides when fast growth should kick in, and allowed fast growth, this is if the fast growth is going to be enabled on the next dropping of grime. Bullet direction, this is the direction of the bullet, which direction it's moving. Playing SFX, that's the current sound. I use my Chibi sound, which takes a value from 0 to 255 for the sound effects, and so it's just a straight copy of that. Control mode, this is the one or two fire button mode. Game tick, this is like a timer that incre increments as the game progresses. This is just sort of used for some control randomization and things. Lives is how many lives the player has left. Animation frame, this is 0 or 16. There are two frames of animation for the grime tiles, and so this toggles between them. Score is a 4-byte binary-coded decimal. 
in packed format, so that those four bytes make up eight digits. High score is just a backup of that, which is the best score the player has had. Animation tick is relating to the refreshing of the screen because the screen is too busy to update in one go. We update it in six stages, and so animation tick is just updating which tick needs to be drawn to the screen next. Debounce count, well, this is a, something I found was a problem on the joysticks of the faster machines. You would be pressing the rotate button on the two button joystick systems, but the rotation would be occurring so fast you'd actually never see it happen. So you were, you were rotating more than you knew you had. So I would put a debounce in where if you just rotated, a few ticks would have to occur before you could rotate again, and that fixed the problem. SNES screen buffer is specific to the Super Nintendo. The Super Nintendo has to uh, write to the video buffer during the VBank, and so we needed to back it up before that. So that SNES buffer is doing that. And Random Seed 2 is an enhanced part of the random number generation. I've, I was having a lot of trouble with random number generation. So then we have to stop interrupts, turn off decimal mode in case it's on, initialize the screen, which is a video system for each of the each of the machines need a different video initialization, so that's platform specific. Then we need to set up our VIC-20 tiles, set up the screen colors, and on the Commodore 64, we need to set up some screen colors as well. On the VDP systems that have a literal hardware tile map, we need to initialize the tiles into memory. So we load the source address, the destination address, and then we dump them all to video memory here. Now we reset the game memory so that everything's back to zero because we don't want any unexpected problems. Now we set the default control mode because we'll have just wiped the memory setting that defines the control mode here. Then we initialize Chibi Sound, which is needed on the Super Nintendo because the Super Nintendo has a special CPU called the SPC700, which does the sound and it's very annoying. So we need to have to prepare it. Then we set up our palette. The palette is slightly different depending on the number of colors, but generally speaking, we can just use this initializer. The set palette command is platform specific. We're going to look at that in the tutorials later. Now we force a repaint. This sets the backup tile map entirely to tile 255, which has the effect of redrawing all the tiles. Then we clear the screen. This is just to get rid of any unused space on the screen because the tile map may be smaller than the visible screen. And now we start filling up the tile map here with the title picture. There is a few adjustments for small screens here, but basically we're just drawing the tile map in. And then we get when we get to here, we're showing the high score message here and just showing the high score. And now we've got to work out the scrolling message, which is quite complex, unfortunately. Essentially, what we're doing is we are working out the starting position, which starts at the far right and then proceeds to the left. And then we are working out the number of characters to draw. If we get to the end of the drawable characters, then we get to this 255 here and we pad the rest out with spaces. But the entire length of the scrolling message, which is at the bottom of the code, has to be within 255 characters because we're only using a single register to calculate this. So when we get to here, this is just a delay. Now, a lot of the systems are actually too fast, so we're having to slow them down to make the scrolling text readable, and that's what we're doing here. Then finally, we're ran changing the random seeds because we want to make sure the random number generation is going to be pretty unpredictable. And so we are waiting f for the fire button anyway, and we're using that to kind of constantly update the random seeds. When we get a fire button pressed, we start the game. The first thing we have to do when we start the game is reset the lives, re-clear the screen, and reset the score. And then once we've done that, we then force another repaint of the screen. And we're just changing the VIC-20 alternate color here. We're using um, some multicolor tiles on the VIC-20, but we're using a a yellow for the alternate color during the title and the game over screen, and a pink in the game, because that looks better. Then we're positioning the player and the bullet to the center of the screen, defaulting the bullet in the player direction. And then we're turning on fast growth and we're dropping a couple of invaders. They appear from the left hand side of the screen and they're the ones that drop the grime. We want to make sure the player's got a challenge, which is why we're forcing that fast growth at the start. Now we get a new random number and we see if we want to drop an, an invader or a descender. If we get to here, then we want to see if we're doing fast growth or not. If we're not, then we get to here. And then we see if we're going to evolve the mold or if we're just going to move the mold or if we're going to pause the game. Now moves are where the seekers fly towards the player very quickly. Evolutions are where the mold actually gets bigger so they don't happen as often and 
pauses are just nothing happening at all. Now the pause loop is here and what we're doing is we're just doing an animate which is where one sixth of the tiles update themselves automatically and that makes the uh, seekers flip around a bit and the grime kind of wobble. And then we've got a pause here just again because some of the systems are really far too fast for this simple game. Now we repaint the screen here, this does the tiles, we show the score again, we show the players lives again here and then we check if the player's not shot anything recently and if they haven't then they're slacking off and so we do this here which is where we create two invaders a descender and we start the fast growth again to get them working. Now at this point we're going to work out where the player is and store these in B and C here, our virtual registers and then we're going to work out the current position of the player and see if the player is still alive. Now the player is defined as alive if they are not blocked in on all directions either by the edge of the screen or by a piece of some kind of mold. So what we're doing is we're checking to see if the player is in at the edge of the screen either zero or the width or the height and we're seeing if any of these directions are not blocked by something else. If they are, are, then we will end up getting to here, but if we're not, they're not, then we will end up going to player still alive. Player dead means the player is completely blocked in, and that will jump to the death routine. Here we're checking the control mode, seeing if we're gonna use one fire button mode, which is this code here, or two fire button mode, which is further down. What we're doing then is we're loading in ZH, which is read in from the read control commands, which is just here. And then what we're doing is we're using these bit definitions to see which of the fire buttons are down. Now, depending on the fire buttons in one fire mode, we also need to check the direction and the fire button. If the direction and the fire button are pressed, then we're changing the firing direction. Otherwise, we're actually moving the player, which is why we've got these two parts here. Now here you can see we're setting the fire direction to down. But if the fire button is not down, then we're actually moving the player, as you can see here. So this repeats for all of the directions. It's very repetitive, but it's basically all the same. Then when we get to here, we've checked all the direction buttons and all the fire buttons, and we're just skipping over the alternate fire mode, which is the two fire mode button. Here's the debounce code. You can see all we're doing is we're checking if the debounce is still working, and if it is, we're skipping over the following code. If the, if the debounce isn't in action, then what we do is we check if there's any fire buttons being pressed. If there is a fire button being pressed, then we set the debounce to two for next time. If a fire button is being pressed with, then we set the debounce to two for next time. Now when we get to here, we're checking the buttons again, but it's a bit simpler this time. You can see we're just checking the directions and not the fire buttons. The fire buttons we check separately, you see. So we're just checking for up, down, left, and right, and we're changing C and B accordingly because those are handling the current player's position. When we get to down to here, we're checking the two fire buttons and we're rotating the player accordingly just by changing the L register here, the virtual register in the zero page. So when we get down to here, this is the generic code which is shared by both modules. Now this code actually isn't used, I don't think, or at least I've never tested it, but um, it, there is an option to flip between the two fire modes here. I've never, I don't know if it works, I've really never tried it, which is um, kind of silly. Anyway, um, and then there's a check for the pause button. If you press the pause button, it shows the pause message on screen and then waits for you to press a fire button and then on pauses when you do. It's very straightforward. When we're getting to here, we're just checking if the player has actually moved. If the player has moved, then we're moving, removing the old tile of the player. Here we're doing the same for the bullet. We're just reading in the bullet position, working out the tile and then setting the tile to zero here. At this point, we are now going to calculate the bullet. So we need to work out which direction the bullet's moving. Then we need to move the position x, y coordinates of the bullet accordingly. And then when we get to here, we just need to check if the bullet has gone off screen. If the bullet's gone off screen, we need to reposition the bullet back at the current player position. And you can see we do that here. At this point, we're actually drawing the bullet. So we're just reading in the B and C and storing them back to the X and Y for the bullet. And then we're setting the bullet tile to five in the current position of bullet, which is in HL, which is found by the find tile command. Now we render tile will of course draw the, the bullet. And here we're actually drawing the player in the same way. At this point we're updating Chibi sound with the playing SFX. If that's zero, then no sound's being played. Otherwise some kind of sound is being played. And then we're repeating the game loop. This is the bullet strike code. All it does is it works out what kind of enemy has been hit by the tile number, and then it's giving the according score and making an appropriate sound. Here the score is being actually added using these BCD add functions here. And then we're updating the random seed a bit because the, a bullet hitting something is a kind of random event. So we want to use that randomness to update the random seed. 
At this point, we're creating a descender. These drop from the top of the screen and invert anything they go over. You can see here that we're picking a random column number here using random number generation, and then we're going to put a descender into that position in the tile map according to the, tile num the column number we selected here. Invaders are similar. They appear at the right-hand side of the screen, so again, we're picking a random number. We need to make sure it's, it's within the size of the screen, and then we have to multiply it by 32 to get a right-hand side coordinate of the screen here, and then we store our descender into the tile map just here. This is the code for the player being dead. We do this kind of descending grime effect, and this is again done with random number generation. We select a column here, and we just will try and work out if that column is currently blank, which we do here. Now, if the grime is already in that position, the 13 grime, tile 13 is used for the descending grime, so there's no other case where you would see that. So all we do is we check if the column has the grime already in that position, and if not, then we increase B until we get to either the bottom of the screen or we find a spot that we can put the grime in. And then when we get to here, we actually store the grime into that new spot and we repeat. Then we have to work out a nice sound to make because we make a kind of descending sound as this all happens. And we update that sound, redraw the screen and pause again as required. Now when we get to here, we turn off the sound and we fill the tile map with grime 13. Because all of this code was very random, there's no guarantee it actually filled the tile map, you see, so we have to fake it. Then we pause once again and we print a game over message to the centre of the screen. Now on the links, we also show the current high score because there wasn't any room for it on the title screen. We also do a binary coded decimal compare of the score and the high score to see if the player has got a new high score or not. If they have, we copy their score into the new high score here. And whatever happened, we wait for a fire button and then jump to the title screen. And here are the messages for the game over. All of the messages are character 255 terminated in my code. Here's the random number generation. We're using the random seed. We're taking th three bits from the far right. We have a random generation source at the bottom of the file. There's eight bytes, you see, so we only want to take three bits here. So we can select a random content from that from those three bits. We then store that into AS here. Then we take another three bits, read in another byte from that in the same way. We XOR that in with this EOR command. And then finally, we do the same with random C2, but this time we use the source code of the program itself from the game loop. Now that is far more, there's more than 256 bytes there, of course, so we don't need to do any filtering there. But the long and the short of all of this is that we are getting a fairly random number as a result. Here's a pause, it's just a counter. We just decrease BC until they're both, both of those zero page values go to zero, and then we return. These are some fast mathematical shortcuts. We often need to add 32 or subtract 32 because this effectively moves us down or up a line. There is also a subtract 64 here because that will move us back up two lines if we've already moved down one line. This is used for some of the code which is checking the current state of the tile map with regards to the grime evolving. Now these are the, this is the seeker code. It looks at current player position and moves the grime closer to the player accordingly. And here we're just saving the seeker position. Here's the evolution code. This is where the grime gets bigger. Now this code has to go through the entire tile map and has to branch out to alternate code. Depending on the kind of mold there is, there's green mold, blue mold, there's descenders, invaders, and seekers. Many of these are similar. You can see here green and blue basically share the same code. And here's the evolve code itself. What it does is both of these jump out to here. And what they do is the green mold will expand in a way that all north, south, east and west of that green mold become also green mold and the middle becomes blue mold. Blue mold does something similar. North, south, east and west become blue mold and the center becomes a seeker. And that's how the seekers grow from the green mold, you see. So the code logic here is essentially looking in each direction and finding if there's a blank space there and if there is, then we are filling that with the mold. And you can see here we're defining the two kinds of mold that, the, that will evolve. So in the case of the green mold, there is the green mold here and the blue mold here. And in the case of the blue mold, there is the blue mold here and there's the seekers here. And then this code is the generic code and uses the inner spore and outer spores here to define what should be put in the places. So this code is doing that evolution effect. 
Now this is a more limited version that does the, just does the fast moving objects, the descenders and the invaders and the seekers. Now the, the, the normal mold won't evolve on these ticks because it's much slower, but it's basically the same. It seeks through the entire tile map, processing all of the mold as it finds it. Now the descenders, they just go down. They need to make sure they don't hit a bullet, of course, and they actually convert the background as they touch it. So there's some code here just to flip the background around here. But essentially, they're just reading in their current location, working out the new location, and they are just altering the background as they pass. The invaders, they come from the right-hand side and move left. They do almost the same thing. They actually randomly drop spores here, you can see. There's some random generation, and they drop more spores on small screens because they have less time passing the screen, so they need there to be a higher probability they'll drop some spores in the smaller time they are on the screen. They also alter the background very slightly because there's no second buffer. They actually swap the locations they cross over, but they don't actually change the mold as such. They just slightly move it by one tile. Debounce here is relating to waiting for fire buttons. So this debounce function is different to the other one. This reads both controls and checks until fire button has been lifted up. This is for pause routines or so presser key routines. Force animate. Now what this will do is this will go through one sixth of the tile map. It moves in chunks of six and it will update all of the tiles to the alternate frame of animation. So this gives a kind of waving animation. It just keeps the screen constantly moving but doesn't use as much processing power as updating the entire tile map. Clear screen, just, just very simple. This clears all of the tile map very quickly. Force repaint clears all of the alternate tile map, setting all the tiles to 255, which has the effect of forcing the redraw routine to completely redraw the tile map. Force Repaint Alt, this is just an alternative version. This is, use, this is used by the clear screen here, just to clear the entire screen, just saving some memory here. Here's Repaint Screen. Now we repaint the screen in four chunks. So we, if you think of each four cluster of two by two, we do each one of those four in separate parts so that the screen it updates in a kind of checkerboard pattern so that it looks a bit less crude when it's refreshing. You don't see a kind of vertical wipe. So the, the do fill command does the actual work and it's just a nested loop and it just cycles through the old tile map and the new tile map comparing the two if they've changed. Then it ors in the animation frame here and then it calls the show tile routine which actually draws the tile to the screen. So HL is the current visible tile, DE was the last visible tile, and if they've changed then we need to redraw here. Now you'll notice there's pushes and pops here. Uh, this was heavily optimised for the 6502 because, the, because there weren't as many registers and pushing and popping the Z page stuff was taking a lot of time. But basically we're re recreating the DE version from the HL version here because they are 768 bytes apart and we can just add hexadecimal 300 to get the effect of that. So we're recalculating the second tile map from the first one every time. And that's reasonably fast in the end. It was very slow in the early days. Find tile. This takes a BC coordinate and it works out the memory location of that tile within the tile map. And this is how we always do the thing of, well, is there a piece of grime under this tile? Is the player able to shoot at the bullet, hit anything? Things like that. We're, we're reading in the position that we want to change or we, we are going to change. And this converts BC into a HL memory address. Of course, this, these are zero page HL, not a literal register. Render tile actually draws a tile. So we do the find tile command again, work out the memory location, read in from the memory location, and then we draw to screen using that BC location in the zero page, BC registers, and using the accumulator, which we read in from HL here. And then we've just got some tiles here, definitions in the appropriate formats. And we've got the VIC-20 colors, the C64 colors, the 16 palette color and the four palette color and the nest version as well which i think in the end it ended up being the same unfortunately i was hoping to do something more like the game boy but i went out of time here's the credits message which scrolls at the top of the on the title screen and a thank you here to all of my patrons including the very kind people who i couldn't fit into the thank you message because it's only 255 characters long unfortunately and then the website here wouldn't even fit on the screen on the vic 20. Here are the binary coded decimal format score additions here. 
pause message, high score message, the Grimes 6502 logo here in tower numbers. And these are some bit definitions for the up, down, left and right. And these are used by the bit command when we're comparing the joystick presses. And here we're loading in some of the functions here to do the job. Now over to simple tile, which does the graphical routine of drawing the tiles. So the first thing we need to do on the tile for format screens is get the VDP screen pause. Now this does various things on various systems, but essentially it's preparing the hardware to receive the byte that we're going to show to the screen. If we're not on the VIC-20, we next have to add 128 because the first graphics tile is 128 in. The first 128 are for font characters. On the NES, we store it to the VDP buffer. If you've seen the tutorials, I'm using a buffer because you can't write straight to the screen on the NES. On the PCE, we can. PC Engine, we use these special commands on the PC Engine, which I've not covered yet, but we will. And these write straight to the VDP memory on the PC Engine. It has its own special commands. It's not a true 6502. It's actually far more advanced than a 6502. Super Nintendo also has a buffer, but it's a much simpler one. So we're writing the data as we're going to store it into the screen into the into the buffer in, in normal memory here, which is in HL. On the VIC, it's just a memory map screen. It's not really a VDP tile map, but it works like one. It's a character map. And so we're just storing the tile in the memory, and then we're offsetting to the color memory. We're reading in the appropriate palette and storing that as well. Now, BBC type screens are slightly different from normal bitmaps. They actually have, they, they go across and they go down then across. So you actually don't need to do an X and Y scan. You kind of just need to do a very long Y scan. Slightly hard, hard to explain, but we will look at it later in the tutorials. But essentially what we're doing here is we're working out the size of each tile and we're multiplying the tile number to work out the memory address in the raw bitmap that we need to read to get the tile data. That's what all of this is doing. And then when we get to this point, we've worked out the correct memory location for the tile we actually want to show within the, the memory of the tile definitions, the bitmap data that makes the tiles look how they should look. Short tile is, of course, relating to the Atari Lynx with its 8x6 tiles. We're just having to do some offsetting here to correct the positioning to get the right screen positions for those shorter tiles. Then what we're doing is we're working out the screen location here and we are going to start drawing a normal bitmap in just a moment. So here we've loaded in our height here into X and then we're starting our loop here. We're reading in from HL here, we're writing to DE and we're repeatedly increasing Y. At this point, we're comparing to see if we've got to the end of the tile because some of our tiles are more than one byte wide if not, then we jump back. If we have reached the end, then we're done and we do the next vertical line until we're done here. We use get next line, which is platform specific to just move down. And then when we get to this point, we're done. This is the BBC version, which is ironically simpler because as I say, it goes down automatically. So we create, effectively, we just keep writing bytes without any kind of screen repositioning, which on an eight by eight basis makes things easier. But if it was any other screen orientation we were using, if we were, our tiles were 10 by 10, it would make things a lot harder. So in this case, we're benefiting just because we're working within the, B, the BBC's in hardware format, if you will. So we're just working out the number of bytes we're going to write here, storing it into Y. And then in the same way, we're reading from HL to DE. But this time we can use Y in both cases and just keep decreasing Y because as I say, the screen is so crude in its weird way that it actually makes things very easy for us. That's all we need to do for the BBC. But on the Commodore 64, we do need to load in the raw palette data and write it to the various registers on the system. The Commodore 64 has two different registers in two places. One is in the original screen memory location and the other is in a separate bank of registers, which is around, I think it's D8 or something, I forget. It's, it's much further in the screen memory and these are literally registers and they only use the low nibble but whereas the, the basic screen memory data actually uses both nibbles so we, we are able to change three nibbles and the fourth color is the screen default so that's really all there is to the simple tile on the grime 6502 code now I, I realize i've kind of rushed it today i've not really gone through it in as much detail as maybe i could have but um I'll be honest with you, I've been seeing this code for far, far too long now. I'm quite tired of it. And I'm actually now working on Grime 68000, so I'm still looking at it again today. So um, please excuse if this was a bit too brief. Um, 
please go ahead and download the code. I hope you'll be able to enjoy it, have some fun with it. I totally encourage you to change it and make something of your own with it. It, it, it was always the intention that this game should be something you should build on because this is how I learned when I grew up. I, I typed in games from um, Amstradot magazines and things and then I modified them and made my own games using their game as a template. So I'm hoping people will have some fun with this and maybe tweak it, make it better or make a whole new game out of it. Anyway, thanks for watching today. Please check out Goim's at 1868000 if you've not seen them yet. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.